Good morning. My name is Tawanda, um, and I'm going to be talking about hepatitis C today. Um, so um, we're going to go over some of the basics. So hepatitis, so hepatitis is an inflammation of the liver. If you break down the word hepatitis, hepa means liver, titus means inflammation of. So hepatitis is an inflammation of the liver. And so hepatitis um, can progress from progress to liver fibrosis, cirrhosis, and even go on to cause cancer. A little bit of scarring is called fibrosis, and a lot of scarring is called cirrhosis. And having cirrhosis puts people at increased risk of uh, liver cancer. And so hepatitis viruses are the most common cause of hepatitis C, but there are other things that can cause um, hepatitis C, including um, certain infections, toxic substance, including alcohol and certain medications, and also immune um, diseases can cause hepatitis C. So in the acute phase of infection, um, this is a short-term infection that develops within the first six months of exposure um, to, um, to an infected person. And so what happens is in this in this phase of infection, um, people may have some symptoms and listed are some of the symptoms that people may have. And sometimes people have these symptoms, sometimes people have absolutely none. And so um, after six months, if hep C does not resolve on its own, like 15 to 20% 20 20 of the people are able to fight off hep C on their own. At that point, if they aren't able to uh, resolve it on their own, they go on to develop chronic infection of hepatitis C. And with chronic and chronic hepatitis C, people need to be treated. Next. So hepatitis C is the most common bloodborne infection in the United States. There are about estimated up to 3 million people who are affected with hepatitis C. It's highly contagious. And it's spread through contact with someone coming in contact with the blood of someone who has hepatitis C. Currently, there is no cure for, I mean, there is no vaccine for hepatitis C, but there is cure. People can go on uh, treatment, um, which is eight to 12 week uh, course of medication, which includes one to three pills taken daily. And at the end of that, people can cure their hep C. Next. So HIV, HCV infection is a serious health consequence of injecting drugs. So one in three people who inject drugs acquire HCV infection in their first year of injecting. And of those people, 45 to 85% of those people don't know that they may become infected with um, hepatitis C. And so people who are at increased risk of hepatitis C includes current and past injection drug users, recipients of donated blood, uh, organs and blood products um, before the year of 1992, before they started screening for the blood supply. And people who have spent many years on dialysis for kidney failure, and people who have gotten tattoos with non-sterile equipment. Healthcare workers who have needle stick injuries, and people with H HIV infections, and also children who are born to parents with the virus. Yeah. So, as you see from this chart, um, like we talked about, injection drug users are the highest population of people um, who get hepatitis C. And although um, it's not common, HCV can be, which is hepatitis C, can be transmitted through sexual activity. And having a sexually transmitted disease or HIV and multiple sex partners increases someone's risk for acquiring um, hepatitis C. And hepatitis C, may be more likely to be spread through anal sex. And this is because the rectal tissue is more likely to tear during intercourse. And as you can see from this chart, as we talked about um, blood transfusions were a source of the infection, and there are some other un unknown um, risk factors for hepatitis C. Hepatitis C. Next. So, here we see the natural uh, history of HCV infection. As we talked about, an acute phase is within the first uh, six months of acquiring um, hepatitis C from an infected partner. Someone um, in this phase, 75 to 85% of the people will go on to have chronic infection. 
as we talked about, 15 to 25 percent of the people are able to spontaneously cure, spontaneously resolve the infection without needing to be uh, treated. So over time, what happens is that people um, need to, um, they begin to get inflammation of the, the liver. And this inflammation can lead to fibrosis, as we talked about, and it can lead to um, cirrhosis. And so after a point of time, some of this stuff, what happens is that people can go on to develop uh, cancer, as we talked about, and liver decompensation. And so drinking alcohol um, actually accelerates the chance of someone um, uh, getting uh, more fibrosis. And so what happens with hepatitis C is we talked about how it affects the liver, but there are some other extra hepatic manifestations that are associated with hepatitis C. And so as you see here, um, you can have problems with the blood, problems with the skin, problems with the kidneys. Um, it can cause depression. There are things with the eyes. Uh, there's things with your vascular system and even your uh, muscle systems that can call, be caused by hepatitis C virus as well. So um, as I talked about worldwide, um, it's estimated that uh, 200 million people worldwide um, have uh, hepatitis C. And so uh, there are six genotypes of hepatitis C. And the most common here in the United States uh, has been one, but there are six other genotypes. And as you see through, um, through, the, through the maps here, that there are genotypes that are um, all around the world. And so those genotypes is just the uh, type of the virus that um, you have. And it dictates uh, what treatment options are available for you. Right. And so as I talked about earlier, it's estimated that 3.2 to 5.2 million people um, are chronically infected with uh, hepatitis C here in the U.S. And some of those numbers are pretty skewed because they don't um, always there are people who um, haven't been um, tested. And so in the both birth cohort, um, there was a lot of uh, information that came out that says people born in between 1945 and 1965 were at increased risk for hepatitis C. And that's because um, these people um, didn't get screened for uh, hepatitis. A lot of times, some, some of those people may have um, injected drugs one time and that kind of thing. And so they were considered the highest population at uh, one point that got hepatitis C. And as we know, a lot of those numbers are uh, going down to people who are younger just because of injection drug use. And so over 50% of the people who are chronically infected with hepatitis C are unaware of their status. And that's because of them not being tested. And so here we see the treatment cascade for people who are chronically in, um, infected with uh, hepatitis C. And as you see, we talked about the 3.5 uh, million people, and those estimates could be even higher. Those are people who are chronically infected. And then we talked about that 50% are unaware. And so as you see, as the cascade go down, it um, actually uh, changes. So a lot of um, the numbers go down, and it's because here where you see HCV RNA confirmed, people have to be confirmed. Um, they may have antibodies um, because antibodies just means that you've been exposed to hepatitis C. But as we talked about, some people clear it on their own. And the only way to know that is to have that RNA test which detects um, the presence of virus. And so out of those 27%, then um, those who go on to be staged for their liver is 17%. And then 16% um, that are actually uh, get on treatment and 9% that actually achieve SDR. So we have a lot of work to do to um, make sure that people have access to a cure because hepatitis C can be cured. Next. So here in Philadelphia, the health department um, estimates that over 25,000 people um, not estimates, but this is what they have on, on file, is that 25, over 25,000 people have hepatitis C. And then there are a lot of people who, like we talked about, are unaware of their status. And so 
out of those people who um, have confirmed RNA, only 13% um, get into care and only 13% um, actually, actually begin the treatment process. So there's a lot of work to do because, like I said, there's a cure for hep C um, that, you know, where um, the side effects are minimal and, you know, people can cure this and it keeps them from passing it on to others. So our See a Difference team, we're a multidisciplinary team that works together to actually um, serve everyone who comes into our clinic and those people that we service in the community to get them from diagnosis to cure. And um, so far, we've uh, had over 2,000 people come in that were antib antibody positive, and most of those had RNA tested. And out of that, um, those had, who were RNA tested, 75% of those people um, had a positive result. And we link 69% of those people to care, and 45% of those people had actually begun treatment and actually cured the virus through um, our Fear Difference program, which is housed in um, John Bell Health Center, which is our federally qualified health center that, uh, that services the community um, at large. So the CDC recommendations for HCV testing is that all individuals over the age of 18 should be tested at least once oh, yeah. in their lifetime for hepatitis C. And so outside of this, um, anyone who has high risk factors for um, hep hepatitis, C, hepatitis C should be screened more frequently. As we talked about, um, it can take up to six months uh, for people to, to go from being um, acutely infected to chronically infected. So people who are at higher risk should be screened more than likely every six months. So the, so treatment is recommended for all patients with chronic hep C, except for those who have a short life expectancy that cannot be uh, remedied by treating the hepatitis C. So there are a lot of uh, people who, um, there were a lot of restrictions around who should be treated, and a lot of those changed because we realized that these people should be cured. And the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease and the Infectious Disease Society of America says that only people who shouldn't be treated is someone who doesn't have a life expectancy of a year prior to uh, the treatment of hep C. So as you can see from this chart here, uh, the treatment options for hepatitis C has progressively evolved. At one time, they, uh, people were being treated with something called interferon. And as you see at the bottom of this chart, some of the people had to be on for six months and then you know 12 months. Um, and some of it included ribavirin. And as you see, some of the rates of cure were only about 50%. In 2013, we began using um, the direct acting agents, which directly affects the hepatitis C. And up in this thing, we see cure of people up to 95% of the people who start treatment for hepatitis C are able to cure their um, hepatitis C. So the thing about hepatitis C, which makes it unique, is that um, the viral dynamics of it means that cure is possible. Unlike human HIV and Hep B, HCV is curable. This is because the HCV RNA remains inside the cytoplasm and it doesn't integrate into the host DNA. And so, when people reach FBR, which is sustained virological response, and that typically happens uh, 12 weeks after someone's takes their final pill, we bring them back in to measure the copies of the virus in their blood system. If they still are undetectable, you, we consider them cured of hep C, and it's almost always durable. So pre-treatment evaluation. So some of the things that happen um, when people come in to see the providers, and these things need to be addressed uh, prior to them being treated. So there's a pregnancy screen that's done and um, screening to see how the kidneys are functioning. 
pregnant women are not allowed to be treated presently for hepatitis C. We also measure viral loads for HIV because we want people's viral loads to be controlled. And so some of the other things that uh, the doctors do is they take, you know, a bunch of blood that determines the genotype. They get a treatment history to talk to patients about, you know, um, how they might have come in contact with hep, hep C, um, you know, and just different things. And also um, disease staging, which is, uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit about later with when we talk about um, the staging um, for liver. So um, it's important in um, the process of treating the hepatitis C to identify um, if, how scarred the liver is for patients. So we use uh, the fiber scan and also a fiber sure blood test to determine um, where people are in the stage of um, fibrosis. And this allows uh, the doctors to de determine how long the patient should be uh, followed because people who have more advanced scarring actually um, are uh, in treatment longer. The doctors follow them for every six months afterwards to get um, an ultrasound to make sure that they don't develop liver cancer. We do not perform liver biopsies at no point of time. And so here um, you can see the progression of liver damage and what a healthy liver looks like. And so a healthy liver is able to perform its uh, normal functions. And, you know, it aids in digestion and it helps to break down uh, drugs, harmful drugs and toxins that are in our body. And so as hep C starts to inflame the liver, it causes um, some scarring and the formation of the scar tissue within the liver. And so extensive scarring um, is called cirrhosis and it can block the flow of blood through the liver and cause lip the liver to function and, you know, to deteriorate over time. And so eventually, um, un, you know, untreated, this can lead to hepatitis, I mean, to liver cancer. And hep C is the leading cause of liver cancer, and which is a malignant tumor in the liver. And as you see, go back, Steve, for me. <clears throat> as you see, um, those numbers down um, the bottom, those are how the liver is staged. So F0 means that there's very little scarring. F1 means there's some scarring. And as you go up, F3 and F4 get to the point where there's more advanced scarring. And, you know, those things uh, tell, tell the providers that um, someone may have cirrhosis of the liver and need to be evaluated further. And so as I talked about um, earlier, we don't use, we never do the biopsy. So we use the fiber scan technology, which is a liver, it tests for liver stiffness. And so what happens is this machine right here, we used to have this machine, but we now have a portable one that's um, able to be taken out into the community. And um, our patients uh, are scheduled to come in for these fiber scans, and it lets us know whether they're F0, F1, F2, F3, F4, along with the fiber sure, which is the blood test. And so some of the health measures in patients with health um, with hepatitis C, so um, our providers are constantly talking to our patients, and, you know, they encourage them um, to not smoke, um, to reduce um, alcohol. And, you know, sometimes what happens is um, people um, who are overweight may also have fatty liver, and that also um, is problematic and, you know, with the hepatitis C. And so our patients are encouraged to talk about all medications that they're on, even things that they take over the counter, um, because everything that uh, we put in our mouth is filtered to our liver and it, uh, it affects the liver health. And so um, one of the things is we have, like I said, a multi uh, multidisciplinary team that we kind of work with to make sure our people don't get lost to follow up, um, because it's important that the people get back for that SDR and also if they need further evaluation because they are cirrhotic. So um, treatment restrictions in the United States. So these were criteria that's used for drug approval for um, our patients to get the hep C, uh, hep C medication. 
And around the country, there is still a lot of places where there's a sobriety requirement, where people have to be free of drug and alcohol for a certain amount of points. And at one time um, here in Pennsylvania, uh, the fibrosis score was a requirement as well. And so um, there are even places around the country that still require patients to have uh, more advanced scarring in order to get, um, in order for them to get their hep C medicine. And so, and also that prior authorization process for the providers is a, a tedious process and it takes a lot of time. And so some of that process has changed um, here in Pennsylvania. There used to be where uh, the fibrosis score had to be F2 or above. And we constantly uh, went up and we fought, uh, we fought with them to make it uh, no restrictions. And eventually it went down to F1. And then eventually now here in Pennsylvania, there's no fibrosis requirement or any sobriety requirement for patients to receive their hep C med medications. And so, um, as you see, this is uh, mapping disease severity. So, as you see, back in 2014, where there, uh, the white part, there is no white part where there is no restriction. And for the most part around, um, around the country, you had to have at least advanced scarring. So, it was the three and the four, as you see, um, is the most prevalent in 2014. Now, and if you take a look at the 2018 um, map, you see that there are a lot of places who no longer have uh, those restrictions for um, disease severity. And there are still some places who um, have the advanced scarring as their criteria. And again, this is the one for sobriety. So where people had to be clean and sober from drugs and alcohol. Um, at some places, like in 2014, there was no restrictions. A lot of places still had to be, people had to abstain from alcohol for a period of one month, three months, uh, six months, or 12 months. And so here in 2018, you see there are some states where there are no requirements, and there are some where uh, people just have to be, the providers have to screen for drug and alcohol and also counsel the patients around the necessity, you know, to, to you know, stop, stop or reduce their risk of, um, reduce their risk. And so these charts were the prescriber uh, specialization. So at one point, um, Hep C could only be done by providers who, you know, specialize in hepatitis C. And so that meant that this excluded a lot of people around the country from getting treated because there, uh, there are some rural areas where they didn't have specialists um, in their area. So a lot of that has changed um, as well around the country because you see in 2018, there are some places that don't have any um, restriction. And then there are some places where um, there's a, just a complication with the specialist. And then uh, there has been a lot of training that um, goes on where uh, people, primary care providers, are actually able to help them to start uh, hep, hep C treatment. So what's the, where does hep C stand right now? Like I talked about earlier, interferon is gone in the um, – in the United States, there are still times where ribavirin has to be used. Uh, like we talked about earlier, 95% of the patients are able to cure their um, hepatitis C. And difficult, difficult to cure populations on, 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 are no longer difficult. And so, um, and people who have co-infections and things like that um, are able to access treatment and get treated, and people who inject drugs, um, they are able to get treated without uh, having those restrictions placed upon them. And even some of the genotypes, uh, including three, which was uh, challenging, there are drugs that treat all genotypes of hep hepatitis C at this present time. And so 
one of the things and it's important to reiterate all the time is because a lot of messages are out there about it being a thousand dollar appeal and um that is no longer the case and there are no sobriety requirements or illness restriction as i talked about here in pennsylvania so the restricted uh re the restrictive re criteria for drugs approved for many payers outside of the uh, Pennsylvania still uh, people are still uh, have to go through the strangest, strenuous uh, things of the sobriety requirement, the prescriber requirement, and also the disease severity, which means that the liver um, has been taking some significant damage to it. And um, HIV may not be a mitigating factor because anyone who has HIV is automatically um, treated for hepatitis C. So the direct acting agent therapy for HIV infected people um, who um, inject drugs is no different from anyone else. So people who inject drug use, um, who, who do injection drug use, should receive treatment because of the, their high risk of transmission. And from what we've known is that our patients are able to um, effectively take their medications. Uh, the only requirements that require is that our patients are able to take their medications at the same time every day. And so here the changes that happen in Pennsylvania with the Medi uh, Medicaid uh, Direct Act and Age um, direct act and agent restrictions. And like I said, in 2014, you had to be F3 to F4 to be treated. There was no exceptions for HIV patients and um, no drugs or alcohol for six months. And it was a specialist that had to treat you. In 2016, they dropped the requirement to F2 for um, people who were just uh, mono-infected. And then um, for patients with HIV who were co-infected, it was still F0. And at this time, there's no longer a sobriety requirement. In 2017, F1 became the standard um, beginning July 1st of 2017. And that's because um, of us going up to Harrisburg and, and actually fighting for that to be uh, to come to pass, and it was a, a a tough fight to get it, and it was like a vote, but it was just ten to nine that they were um, able to to get that uh, requirement going. And then now there's no sobriety, no sobriety requirement, also no uh, provider requirement. And so in 2018, beginning in January of 2018, there's no. Um, no disease, disease severity that is uh, used uh, for that, um, for people to, to get their medication, and no sobriety and no provider requirement. And so when patients who um, have insurance and their insurance will not, not uh, cover the drug, what are the options for us? Sometimes you have to wait for new drugs to be approved, but also, um, a lot of times what happens is we're able to get patients medications through the patient assistance program. Um, so we have benefits counts, we've had benefits counselors and our case managers help people to get, you know, get insurance so that they can um, qualify if they haven't had insurance at the beginning of their hep C treatment. So here in Philadelphia, um, there's a lot of advocacy going on around hepatitis C. And as I talked about earlier, um, when we went up to Harrisburg to, um, to fight against uh, the strict requirements, uh, HEPCAT right. was very instrumental in, um, in uh, organizing um, people to go up to fight that. And HEP HEPCAT is the hep Hepatitis C uh, Allies of Philadelphia. And it's a collective of people who are dedicated to improving the con continuum of hepatitis C prevention care and support services here in Philadelphia. And um, if you want more if information, please log on to the website just to check it out. They have meetings and things like that. Um, 
that uh, has a lot of information about hep C, the guidelines, and just different things around hepatitis C in the fight to improve hepatitis C care for people here in Philadelphia. And as I told you, I work with a multidisciplinary team on our See a Difference program. We have our hep C uh, case manager. We have patient navigators. We have our um, HIV and hep C testers who go out into the community to provide testing and link those people who test positive back, in, um, back into care. We have our care coordinators and um, our special projects coordinator and our chief operation medical officer, and she's the director of uh, hepatitis C program, Dr. Stacy Truskin. And we also uh, work uh, we work with our, our providers, our pharmacists, and our nurses. Um, we meet weekly to discuss each of our patients who are on um, hep C treatment so that we make sure that we get them from each point on the care cascade. We want to make sure that everyone gets their medication. We, if necessary, we go out and deliver patients their medications to the programs that they're at to their houses or wherever we can find them. And, you know, it's all so that all, all people here who are serviced by us in John Bell and out in the community um, get from their, uh, their initial diagnosis to cure. And so I just would like to thank Philadelphia Fight, our viral hit hepatitis C program, our Jonathan Lacks Treatment Center staff, the John Bell Health Center staff, and also Gilead uh, Sciences who provide our grant funding for um, some of the work that we do here. And if anyone has any questions, concerns, um, here's uh, ways that you can reach out and contact me. Thank you, Tawanda. Hello? Yes, I hear you. Okay, so I can go ahead and start then. Okay. Hello, everybody. Again, my name is Stephen Johnson. I am the co-coordinator for the Teach Outside program at Philadelphia Fight. Today, I'm going to talk about HIV 101, just basically get the facts. Some of the topics we're going to go over today is HIV basics. HIV and AIDS are not the same. HIV transmission and prevention, HIV testing, treatment for HIV, and we're gonna learn some more things. So this is a map of Philadelphia um, in 2016. Okay, and what it does, what it is, it shows that in every area, in every section of Philadelphia, there's somebody living with HIV and AIDS in almost every section. If you look at the colors on the map with, with white being no cases to, to uh, 10 or more being a darker shade of teal, you know, it's, it's people everywhere in Philadelphia that has HIV. And if you look over there and, and, and where the prisons is at, over there on State Road, you know, it's, it's, it's high amount of people in, in the jails that find out because they don't find out that they're HIV positive and two, they go to jail. You know, back in 2003, that's how I found out when I was incarcerated. Okay, but also, we know that these numbers are going down over time. There's a lot of, lot of infections. In 2016, we had 427 newly diagnosed people. But the data shows that by us doing what we do, the work that we do, by educating people, by getting the word out about testing, that, you know, there's some positive things going on. There's some results in here. In 2018, we only had, I'm sorry, I'll get you backwards, 470 was for 2016 and 427 is for uh, 2018. And that in 2018, the city had 18,380 people living in it with HIV and AIDS. So what is HIV? HIV is basically, it's a human immunodeficiency virus. This is a virus that is passed from human to human, not human to cat, dog, none of that. It goes from human to human. And what this virus does, it weakens your immune system over a period of time. And if you're not on medication, it could lead you to death. So we know that HIV is a virus, and what this virus does, it infects your CD4 cell. 
okay, and your CD4 cells or your T cells or your, your helper cells, okay, and all these cells are found in your thymus gland, which is produced in the thymus gland, which is found right about here. If you can see me in this part is your thymus gland, and they make all your CD4 cells. So what it does is CD4, so you got this free virus, okay, that just came in at the initial infection, and you got your CD4 cell. Okay, and what this virus does is attaches itself. It attaches itself to your CD4 cell. Okay, then it inserts its RNA into your CD4 cell. Okay, and what it does after it gets inside there, it changes the codes, okay? So think of it like this. I have a factory and all I'm making is Ken Barbie dolls, okay? Somebody breaks in, sneaks in, disguises itself, get past security, goes and changes my code. Now all it's making is Barbie dolls. So, so that's what HIV does. It takes your CD4 cells and say, you're not making no more CD4 cells. You're going to start making HIV. HIV and, and AIDS are not the same. You know, remember that HIV is the virus, right? And AIDS is a diagnosis someone gets only after uh, the virus or HIV has seriously weakened their immune system. Okay, and what that looks like is means that if you got you got your CD4 cell for everybody, it's 500 to about 15 or 1600. Whether you have a compromised immune system or not, that's the norm. But with people for HIV, when their when their CD4s drop below 200, okay, that's when you have a diagnosis. You receive a diagnosis as AIDS. Okay, and AIDS stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. It's the end result of what, the, what HIV, the virus, is doing. Okay, you can have HIV and not AIDS, okay, because um, HIV is the virus and AIDS is not. It's just the end result. You can't have AIDS without having an HIV diagnosis. Okay, some people have compromised immune system. Some people that does not have HIV and their immune system dip below 200 they don't get an AIDS diagnosis because they don't have the virus in them. You have to have the virus in, you have to have HIV in you in order for you to get an AIDS diagnosis. And this here slide is what I just talked about, about it being under uh, uh, 200 copies of CD4 cell, or it can be uh, um, an opportunic infection that's found on uh, the CDC list. The three stages of HIV infection. And what we don't talk about, this is a person that's not in treatment, is not receiving art, but this is a person that, that's not on nothing. Okay, so we have that, the first period is that incubation period, is the initial infection all the way through the end, so you get an AIDS diagnosis or death, whichever one that is. Okay, and, and you have the window period. The window period can range from around, it says three to six weeks, but with newer technology, antibodies they found people have been producing antibody two weeks to six months so it's different basically it's different strokes for different folks in this um the second one is the first stage is acute or primary infection and this is uh two to four weeks after infection um you may receive like flu-like symptoms okay and these symptoms can include like uh fever rash you know nice sweats. you know like i mentioned that i'm I, i'm a person living with hiv in the beginning, I didn't know what it was, but I had night sweats, whereas I, I, I soaked the bed, you know, I soaked the sheets, I soaked the mattress, I had to take everything off and let it dry out. And I didn't know why, what was going on with me at that time. But I had a higher amount of virus in my body. The second stage is a symptomatic or chronic infection. Okay, it's called clinical or latency feels and look healthy you know it's like after after i got over that little night sweats and, and 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 the cold and stuff like that there i just chalked it up this is what i have you know i would have never imagined or, or or that i had hiv and that i was experiencing these side effects from the virus hiv is active and damage your immune system whether you feel like it or not it's 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 doing this thing symptom may develop towards the end of the stage and at the end of the stage is AIDS. And we talked about what is AIDS, it's, it's the diagnosis, okay? And it's either HIV under 200, below 200, or an opportunity infection on the CDC list. HIV can only be transmitted through these fluids. It cannot be transmitted no other way. 
Okay, we talk, it'd be transmitted blood is the number one, blood, semen, vaginal fluids, breast milk, rectal fluids, and pre-cum, which is not on here, it should be on here. It's six ways of transmission. You know, it's, 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 you can't get it if, if somebody uh, through saliva or kissing or hugging, drinking after somebody, the swimming pool, you know, all those are myth. Only if these, if you have not had one of these ways, even if I had a cut on my hand and I'm bleeding, didn't realize it, and I go to shake somebody else's hand and there's no cut on their hand, there's no transmission because HIV needs to get into your bloodstream in order for it to start doing this thing. So protecting yourself and others, you know, some of the things you should do, you should avoid sharing syringes or needles. Uh, when injecting anything, drugs, hormones, insulin. See, when we think about, when we hear syringes and stuff like that, the first thing we think about is somebody using drugs. But you know, people take insulin, people use hormones and stuff like that. But so you wanna, you wanna be, you wanna be safe with. You don't wanna share needles. You know, you wanna, you wanna wash them, bleach them if you have no other choice. You have to keep things clean and safe for you. Um, use protective barriers, right? Uh, such as condoms, you're talking about dental dams, we're talking about uh, 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 condoms. Now, the, the, the female condom is, 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 is a wonderful condom because it can be used in various ways. If you are allergic to, to, to condoms, to uh, polyurethane, well, the, um, the female condom is polyurethane, but if you're allergic to latex, go with the female condom. And they also have for polyurethane condoms for men. Okay, you know, if you're HIV positive, you know, they don't have enough research about transmission from mother to child through the breast milk. So don't do it, you know, use, use baby formula rather than breast milk. What is pre-exposure prophylaxis? And we say PrEP. And you know, PrEP is this one pill that you take once a day and it's Truvada and Truvada is a, a part of the HIV regimen medications that people who are HIV positive take. Okay, it's 95% effective at preventing HIV infection and HIV negative individuals who are exposed to the virus. All right, PrEP can be used along with other safer practices like male and female condoms and dental dams. You know, because PrEP, what PrEP does, PrEP is only want to protect you against HIV. It does not protect you against other STIs. So protect yourself by if you want to use your own PrEP and you're using PrEP, use extra precaution. Use the condoms. Protect yourself. Protect your partner. Trivada for PrEP is approved for all people regardless of sex or gender who are HIV negative. Some common myths about PrEP. You know, PrEP isn't a drug for someone like me. PrEP can only protect anyone from acquiring a new HIV diagnosis. Anyone can acquire HIV. HIV does not discriminate on, on your gender. It does not discriminate on whether you're male or female. It does not, it does not care what color you are. It, anybody, everybody is acceptable to getting HIV if you are exposed to it. Uh, PrEP encourages unsafe sexual behavior. Okay, they have some studies of participants taking PrEP. It was not shown to increase risky behavior. Okay. If on PrEP, there is no need to use condoms. While taking PrEP, it is important to continue practicing safer sex, especially for prevention of other STIs and pregnancy. We already talked about that. You know, uh, be, be mindful and know that PrEP is only for HIV and nothing else. Uh, PrEP leads to HIV medication resistance. Resistance can only occur in the presence of a virus, okay? If you don't have the virus, then, then you're not building no resistance to it. What is NPEP? NPEP stands for Non-Occupational Post-Exposure Prophylaxis, okay? NPEP is, can be directly reduced the possibility of infection after exposure to fluids that contain HIV virus. Okay, MPAP, you got to take this within 24 to 72 hours after the initial exposure in order for it to be most effective. You know, but you know, as you say, it's better to sooner than later. Uh, MPAP is taken for a month and MPAP pre helps prevent the virus from entering CD4 cells and replicating. So if you think that you have got a needle prick, okay, or you're having, you had, you're having sex, the condom break, or you just 
having the heat of the moment, okay, and you, you go in raw, okay, and you come to your senses afterwards, you go to the emergency room, tell them I might have been exposed to HIV so they can start you on this regimen. It is three pills for NPEP and that you have to take, I think, for 28 days. Testing is empowering, okay? CDC recommends you get tested at least once a year. Um, if you got multiple sex partners, you know, if you got, you got a lot going on in your life, then you need to be tested. You know, if you are injection drug users or you share needles, you need to be tested. Uh, if you are out there and, 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 and you just, I don't care, because some of us feel that way sometimes, get tested. Or a quick rapid HIV test or sold over the counter. You can, get, you can do an HIV test at home. You can get a home kit and test yourself in your privacy. Nobody don't have to know. You don't have to worry about going to a place and you coming out and somebody thinking, oh, you had a test and you got a test. You know, so you can you have to do that in the privacy of your own home. Okay, like Philadelphia Fight, we have that, that one minute rapid test. You will know in 60 seconds. Um, a lot of, uh, you can get tested at also, um, I think Action Wellness does vaccine prevention point and other places, just to name a few. Treatment as prevention. All people living with HIV in Philadelphia can get treatment from any HIV specialist, regardless of their ability to pay for it. Okay, if you are a person with HIV, there is help for you. Whether you have insurance or not, you can get help. And let's, let's talk, talk about treatment. You know, if you look at that back in 2004 and, and before, people was taking 30, 20, and 30 pills, you know, or more in one day. Today, where we at today is we have, we have one pill. So we came a long way, we came a long way. You know, you can find assistance for if you need help paying with your uh, uh, um, HIV medications, your SPBP, and that's a special pharmaceutical benefits program. And we, uh, Philadelphia Fight has an HIV clinic guide, okay? In that guide, they got all the clinics, all the information that you would need or you, or, and resources that you would want if you are HIV positive or if you're HIV negative and want to seek out some information, you should have that or get that, seek to get that. U equals U. Undetectable equals untransmittable. What does undetect undetectable mean? You know, for people living with HIV who adhere to their medications get to a point in time when their HIV viral load is at or below 20 copies of milliliters. Uh, viral load is the amount of virus and uh, a person has in their body. You know, in different states, depending upon the equipment, you know, the viral load in some places are 50 and still 75, you know, below uh, 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 um, copies of milliliters of blood. What does untransmittable mean? They will not pass HIV to their sexual partners as sexual partners. Okay, keep that in mind. If you have fewer than 20 copies of the uh, virus in your body, you will not transmit HIV to someone else sexually. And I added that there because I don't want no one to get confused. Okay, it's, it's that you, you undetectable viral load for at least six months. You want an undetectable viral load for six months. Okay, and it's only for transmitting sexually. It's not, it does not, it does not say for needle sharing. There's not enough information, resources, or research on that to say that U equals U goes for our needle sticks also. So with more on U equals U, transmission of vaginal or oral sex, yes. Anal sex, yes. Other STIs, no, it don't qualify for that. Remember, uh, barrier methods can reduce your risk for other STIs. So it does not, it, it won't do that. It does not work for pregnancy. It does not work uh, for mother to child doing breastfeeding and sharing needles. There's, there's not enough, I'm gonna say that again, there's this, uh, it's not enough information for that, but it's only six months undetectable viral load, okay? And it's only sexual. Some of the goal of treatment is, you know, we want to rebuild the, uh, your immune system up. We want to get the CD4s going back up, okay? So the goal of HIV treatment is to make the immune system strong again so that a person can fight off infections on his or own. So once, once, we, once we start treatment with the uh, medication does, it gives our body a break. It gives us like that, 
who who saw a moment, you know, to to for the body to go ahead and start doing these things again to give the body a chance to start making more CD4 cells, which we need in order to fight off the virus and other infections and, and bacteria and germs. The good news is that the immune system is really good at repairing itself. You know, it just needs that break what we just talked about. It just needs that that woo side moment so we can go ahead and start doing this thing again. Some treatment considerations. All right. Treatment can. It can stop HIV in its tracks. It can suppress it, but it won't cure it. There's no cure. I wanted to state that there's no cure for HIV. All our medicine does is suppress it. It keeps it at bay. Uh, restore the immune system function. We talked about that. It gives the body a chance, gives the immune system a, a chance to start rebuilding uh, uh, them CD4 cells that was depleted because of the HIV. Prevent OIs, opportunity infection. Uh, allow you to fight back against HIV. But on the other hand, without medical coverage, treatment may be expensive, but we talked about SPBP. You know, there is a way. There is a way that you can get in treatment and stay in treatment. There are ways. Some people experience side effects. 90% adherence may be difficult for some people. I know, I'll just tell the truth. Some days, man, I just get tired of I don't want to take a pill. I, 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 some days I, I just, whoop, but I still take it. But that don't, that don't change that feeling that, hey, ah, I'm just tired of all these pills. I'm tired of taking all these pills. But we still do because that's how we stay alive. That's how we function properly. Just remember that you're not alone. You know, there are people in programs who can support you through all your treatment decisions. We have treatment here at Philadelphia Fight. There's other programs that have treatment. You know, so whatever whatever your uh, 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 thing is, get in treatment. If you're HIV positive, newly diagnosed, get into treatment. The sooner you get into treatment, the better it will be. Everybody's body's different. Like I said, it's different strokes for different folks. You know, um, some people may develop symptoms within three years after HIV infection, while others haven't, you know, for more than, uh, uh, developed symptoms for over 20 years or more. You know, why is that? You know, because sometimes they've, it's been found that people with HIV, their immune system is, is, is strong enough, healthy enough to battle the HIV, to keep the HIV at bay on its own. So some people can fight off HIV without medication. Some people need art right away. Some people don't. You know, it depends on where you was at when you got diagnosis. You know, when I when I first got diagnosis, they my my um, my CD4 count was above a thousand, and I was instructed to stop taking your meds. And I haven't I didn't take meds for two years, but complications arose. So if you're taking HIV medication, don't stop. Continue to take your medicines. Okay. Uh, anyone who is living with HIV should be making regular visits to a medical provider. Stay in contact. I think whether it's, I think it's every six months, three months, depending on your condition, but um, it's usually every six months, twice a year now. What does all this mean? You know, uh, back in the 80s when AIDS came on the scene, it was a death sentence. But thank, thank God, and that's just for me, thank God. You know, it's not a death sentence anymore. And that's only because of the medications that, that, you know, that's because of other people's sacrifices that went into HIV care research, you know, that helped us get from 30 pills to one pill. You know, this is, this is what it takes. It takes sacrifice. It takes a long time for HIV to weaken the immune system so much that a person would be at risk for getting sick. You know, uh, it, took a, it took a while, it took a long while for me to even recognize, I still didn't know what was going on with me. I had no symptoms until one day I couldn't get rid of a cold for 30 days. Eh, go figure. There aren't many surprises when someone living with HIV and their medical brother work together and keep an eye on their lab work. You know, very important. You know, when we talk about lab work, you know, um, we talk about, it, for some of us, it's just, I'm undetectable, my viral load is good, I'm good. You know, you need to get more involved in your lab work. You need to know, you know, how's my cholesterol? You know, how's my triglycerides? What do my liver look like? You know, pay attention to your lab works. You know, what's my CD4 percentage count? Is, is, is my body holding steady with the amount of CD4s I got or is it making, is it making more? 
or is it not? You know, so these are things that you want to pay attention to, to be more alive, to be aware, to be alive. Okay. There are lots of resources available for people living with HIV. There's plenty of information here at Philadelphia Fight and, and, and other places like Action Wellness, you know, the partnership. It's, there's a lot of places that you can get information for. But just to throw that out there, Project Teach, if you want to take part in a virtual meeting, Project Teach will be starting virtually next month, I think the 8th, September the 8th, excuse me, September the 8th will be starting. So be looking forward to that, you know, sign up for that. You know, HIV services, lots of people need, you know, we all need a case manager, you know, you know, you need a case manager in order to get housing, you know, to plug you into all the services, you know, to get you through the resources that you need. Okay, and this can be accessed through the, our uniform access benefit program and the telephone number is there. Long term housing, you know, a specific housing is set is accessed through HIV case management. It's always a waiting game. We know that housing in some places is up to, it's up to eight years. So, you know, so, you know, be mindful of that and have some practice some patience. Um, the AIDS Law Project, you know, um, related legal issues, no criminal cases, you know, cases such as, hey, you're being discriminated in your apartment building, you know, your landlord want to kick you out because he found out that you was HIV positive. Okay, you want a job and they discriminate you on a job, they fired you because you are HIV positive contact AIDS, AIDS uh, 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 Law Project, and they will make that right for you because we all have rights, whether we're HIV positive or not. When you have questions here are good places to go for information. You know, the Critical Path Learning Center, all the information, all the information you would ever need about HIV and AIDS can be found there. All the resources that you would need can be found there. Um, this Critical Path Learning Center, the telephone number is there. Um, the website, criticalpath.org, or you can email them at criticalpath at fight.org. And you know, there's, there's other ways that you can research information. That's AIDS Infonet, the CDC. Okay, you know, you want to go on a reputable web page, you know, because everybody's information is not accurate, but the CDC AIDS Infonet is accurate information about each other. Thank you. That's the end of my presentation. I want to thank y'all for listening. Okay, Kyle, I'll put the ball back in your court. Wonderful. And uh, Tawanda, we're just going to ask you to unmute and uh, start your video. We have a few questions. Uh, some regarding uh, hepatitis C and some specific to HIV. So I'm gonna go ahead and read these questions. Some of them are really good. Okay. Um, the first one asks, has hep C really been cured or, or is it suppressed? Is the HCV virus no longer present in your body? And this question so, is for you. Um, okay, so as I talked about earlier, um, what happens is at the end of uh, your HCV treatment. Um, here at John Bell um, with our providers, we're constantly monitoring um, the viral load to see how it goes down. Uh, a lot of times our patients have their blood drawn at two weeks, four weeks, and at the end of treatment. And so to get, be considered cure um, of uh, hepatitis C, that means that you have had, uh, you have had uh, a sustained virological response uh, 12 weeks after treatment. And so that, that means that um, you have, you know, you come back in 12 weeks afterwards, you draw your blood and it, it's still undetectable. They, that is what they uh, consider to be cured. And what it is, is that it comes back, the viral load comes back undetectable. And the data suggests that people will remain virus free, um, virus free. Now, um, as we talked about earlier, there's no vaccine for um, hepatitis C. So this is not a vaccine. It doesn't prevent people from being reinfected with uh, hepatitis C. So if people go out and use, um, uh, come in contact with infected blood again, they can um, become infected again with hepatitis C and need to be treated again. But their um, hepatitis C right now is the only virus that they can that is considered curable. Thank you for that clarification. Um, 
The next question asks, can you talk more about how you see sobriety restrictions interacting with hepatitis C treatment? What have you noticed in Philadelphia specifically? Okay, so um, with a lot of the patients that um, we see now sobriety, uh, there are no uh, sobriety restrictions here in Philadelphia, um, but our providers do talk uh, extensively with patients about reducing, you know, their um, intake of alcohol and, you know, um, those kind of things. And uh, we work, we work uh, a lot with some of the drug rehabilitation programs. So we do see people who go through, who come through more than once. And so what happens is we know that the nature of addictions is, is that people, you know, may not, um, you know, may not, uh, cure the first time and have to go through treatment again. But there, you know, sobriety uh, requirements hasn't been a thing for us in uh, Pennsylvania since 2018. But we do hear from a lot of the, the patients that we encounter at these programs that they have gone other places where they have been told that they need to be clean and sober from drugs before they get treated. But that is not the case. That is not the case um, for hep C treatment here at John Bell Health Center. And thank you again for that clarification. And uh, yeah, uh, just as a note, um, you two both know, but to the audience, we uh, utilize a harm reduction model here at Philadelphia, yeah. right? And we meet folks where they are, so. Mm. Yes. Um, next question. Can PrEP be prescribed by a primary care doctor? Stephen? Uh, as far as I know, not all primary care doctors will prescribe it, but yes, they can prescribe PrEP. And if you have uh, uh, problems getting Philadelphia Fight, we have our PrEP team down there. You can go down to Philadelphia Fight or contact them and they will let you know about PrEP. Absolutely. Thank you for that reminder, Stephen. Um, Fight does provide PrEP. And uh, like, like you said, um, if a doctor doesn't, we will happily help you out with that. Um, next question, what is the reasoning behind frequent testing if the at-risk behavior still exists? Is it simply to link to care sooner? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I guess uh, both of you could take that on. Okay. So, Linda, do you want to start? Okay. Um, for Hep C, um, we, one of the things is um, we made uh, test people again, because um, a lot of our clients um, still are at risk at times. And so one of the things is even when um, they get their SDR, we do encourage them if they're at risk, again, that they should be retested. And that's because, you know, it, you know, what happens is they may, you know, I see people who come in to Kirkbride and, you know, they're on, um, they're just coming into Kirkbride for drug, re, you know, rehabilitation. And, they've had a recent exposure um, to hep C again, because now, even though they may have cured, they've been sharing needles uh, with other people. And so there is a need for them to be, uh, have repeat testing to make sure um, that they no longer, you know, like that, that they don't have virus. Because at that time, if they, if, even if they cured hepatitis C, um, having an antibodies test, anybody who has hepatitis C is always going to have antibodies for the rest of their life. So having a viral load test will let us know if that encounter uh, put them at uh, risk for uh, hepatitis C again. So we do um, encourage our patients to come down. We, uh, our case manager has a support group um, that she runs um, that uh, helps people to deal with some of those things. And so um, we try to meet our clients, uh, like Carl talked about earlier, where they are. And so if retesting is necessary, we do it. Hmm. Okay, and what I would add on to for a person that's getting tested for HIV, if you're out there and uh, experiencing or doing risky behaviors, then yeah, you should get tested often. Now, a person that might get an antibody test, and if that antibody test might come up positive, then the next test is a blood draw just to make sure that you have it in your body because sometimes you get a false negative. But you're only gonna get tested as, as long as you're out there doing risky behaviors, get tested. You know, if, 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 if you're not doing nothing like that, at least get tested once a year. 
Thank you. Thank you to both of you. And I just want to add, uh, we don't like stigmatizing behaviors. Um, we believe in really great uh, prevention education and uh, outreach um, in uh, combating um, these types of things. So we really don't like stigmatizing behavior. So thank you, Tawanda. And thank you, Stephen. That was, those were great responses. Um, uh, we actually have a note from uh, one of our fight employees, Val. Uh, many of you know her. They, uh, <laughs> they mentioned fight is offering take home HIV testing. Um, and you can call 215-525-8649 for that. Um, so okay. it looks like those are all the questions at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, do either of you have any closing thoughts? Um, I just want to say this was a tremendous uh, presentation. I want to thank you both for kind of bringing us full circle. As I mentioned earlier, um, June was really a month to delve deep into those really specified topics as they pertain to uh, HIV. And I think this was a great time to recalibrate ourselves and look at the basics of HIV and HCV. Well, well thank you, Carl, for giving us an opportunity to do this webinar. But I also want to mention, if I can, that the Positive Man is a support group. It's my support group, and this is a support group for HIV-positive men that self-identifies as straight. And what that means is that basically it's what you know that you are and not what other people think that you are. Um, if you want to find out about HIV cure research, you know, what's going on around town, you got cure research at Fight, and we also do it at BeatHIV.org. And you can go on that web page and, and, and find out all about HIV cure research. Thank you. One of the things that I uh, would say is um, and send a reminder is a lot of times people think that um, injection drug use is the only way that people get uh, hepatitis C. And that is not true. Like um, anything where any situation where you come in contact with infected blood puts you at risk for hepatitis C. And some of those things include um, uh, sharing the other, uh, you know, equipment uh, for injection drug use, um, also sharing straws for intranasal drug use, also uh, sharing crack pipes, and also tattooing puts people at risk if it's done in unlicensed settings, um, you know, and those kind of things. And people who share uh, common household items, we also always encourage people not to share hair clippers, nail clippers, um, and those type of things, razors and toothbrushes, which may have blood on them. And if people share them, they could possibly put themselves at risk for hepatitis C. Mm. So it's always to reiterate that because a lot of people uh, try to uh, – Make it about that only, it's only something that injection drug users get. And no, that's not the case. And the way um, for people who have hepatitis C, um, like we talked about very early on in the presentation, uh, there may be no symptoms. And so you can be asymptomatic for a long time. So the only way to know if um, an exposed to hepatitis C would be to get a test. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tawanda. And thank you, Stephen. Um, and just a reminder, that number again to get uh, at home, uh, take home HIV testing is 215-525-8649. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, you can email any one of us. Uh, you can email cheetah at ch ta at fight.org. And don't forget to take the follow-up survey after the completion of this webinar. And also as a note, all of our webinars are archived on our YouTube page and you can find more information out about us at our Facebook, che at cheetahphilly. Dot, or at cheetah Philly. Um, so thank you to everyone who joined us today. And uh, don't forget to register uh, for our next uh, upcoming webinar series discussing anti-Blackness and the different ways uh, and the different intersections of that. We're gonna be uh, breaking down a lot and having a lot of really meaningful conversations. So join us for that. And uh, thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye.